Welcome to another episode of Unfiltered with Boss One. Welcome back, and we are back with another episode with Boss One and One himself. Hello. Hello, hello. Yes, so last week we were answering some of our questions for our viewers, correct? Right, right. Yeah, so I think in just uh, just one, two weeks, we've gotten more questions. Mm, so I think week. we are back to answering questions. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comment section of anywhere you're watching our videos, be it TikTok, YouTube, or Instagram. All right. So without further ado, let's dive back into the question. So basically, recently we actually did an infographic. It's about owner-occupied. Owner versus owner-essential occupier. Mm. It's a ownership structure arrangement. For right? HDB. Yeah. For HDB, correct. So we were not say recommending, we were, we were suggesting that a way to do it is it to could be done it. in this way yeah. for some of the couples that we have met uh, throughout our career. Correct. And uh, of course, there are reasons why they choose to do so. Mm. Mm. So we were actually sharing with them that maybe one way is to put one person as the essential, uh, is the owner. Then the other one is the essential occupier, correct? Right, yeah. So maybe after five years, once the HGB MOP is, then the essential occupier can then leave, right? To mm. purchase a second investment property. That is correct. correct. Yep. Yeah, so that is the only route that one can take to essentially own a HGB and private condo in Singapore, correct? Well, uh, when you say only route, I, I mean, maybe we take this time at the podcast to elaborate a little bit further from the infographics that we have posted. What it actually means and what type of uh, couples would actually explore this are for couples who actually uh, have a future plan of a five years horizon, at least as you have correctly pointed out about the MOP, because a lot of people do not know that actually to form a family nucleus to buy a property in a HCB, right? Um, it does, does not necessarily mean that you both have to be owners. Mm. That has been the traditional thoughts, uh, I think, since our parents' age. La. And uh, therefore, to form a family nucleus, actually it all means that one has to be the owner, if it's a uh, fiancé, fiancé scheme, and the other can be an occupier or in any other uh, marriage uh, arrangements, right? So so with that, um, actually the occupier would also be going through this five years of uh, minimum occupancy period. And thereafter, now I add on a little bit more to your phrase of, is that the only way to buy two properties? Uh, one being the HCB, one being a private property. Uh, the answer is no, actually. Oh, you can okay. just buy. However, if both were the owners of the HTB, okay, okay, there's two issues now. Mm. First issue is that they will have to suffer ABSD. Mm, and yeah, based on right. current rates, uh, that would be 20% on top of the usual buyer stamp duty depending on how big the quantum of the next property it can be. 3, 4, or 5%. Now, um, having said that, let's say you are okay. So we just use a number, for example, of a $1 million. Uh, that means before we talk about the initial down payment of the $1 million that is today, at least $250,000, yes, right? Correct. If you if you stretch a uh, full 75% loan. If you add on the 20%, that will be another $200,000. Not forgetting about, as I said, the 3% stamp duties. So all in all, we're talking about almost half a million dollars going in mm. just to own a property. That is if you have fully paid up your first property, which is your HTV. Correct. Right? If you have not, this is the second issue. Mm. You will actually only be able to borrow 45% oh. because it's your second residential loan. Now, therefore, when we separate out the names, as one of the owner of the HDB, the other being the new owner of a private condo, not just they save on some additional buyer stamp duties, right? The second thing is that if their pay or salaries or income declared to the IRAs allows them to loan, they could actually borrow a full 75% again on another property mm. because they will never be borrower of the first property. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's the two things that um, with careful planning, you can have more leveraging uh, basically in your whole entire property journey. But there are some downsides, right? I think it's not for everyone for this method, right? So for example, the only essential, the only owner is the only one that can utilize the CPF, right? That's right. As yeah. well as the bank loan or HDB loan amount, right? Yeah. Only yeah. his income can be considered, yeah. right? So what would you say to that? Is, that, is, that uh, is this method quite often used in terms of from my experience or is it quite rare actually? Well, it's a very good question, Sean, but you see, in the first place, as a lot of people who have commented in our infographics as well as the videos done, uh, when we do such uh, a sharing of what are other people doing in their portfolio management, we often get like, hey, you know how often we see people of such income bracket, which I totally agree. Mm -hmm. You see, because the point is that First thing first, we must recognize that 80% of us still live in a HTB in Singapore. Mm. Right. That being said, uh, if I just use a quick ballpark, that probably that's, that, that also means 20% are uh, either they don't own a property or they, they, they probably right. uh, own a private property, right? Mm. Now, let's just say they own a private property. Then we, we have to split into 
landed and uh, condominiums and so on and so forth, workout apartments and stuff. But then my, let's just lump them all together for now. And if we put in more thought into that, it's also saying that only 20 of the twenty percent of the population of Singapore can afford to be in a private condo. Mm. What more now we talk about owning two, two. properties? Okay. Probably lesser than the twenty percent, right? Definitely. Mm. So in that place, uh, if we were to think through this uh uh mentally, it also means that it is not for everybody. Because mm. not everybody makes this kind of household income, which I totally agree. Yeah. So to begin with, it's for people with both not just the husband being a strong income earner. Wife also strong in Canada or vice versa. And then we can then think about this in the future plan. Mm. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, if we if we start young while they are still young as a newly wet or something like that, uh, and they know they are in jobs, let's say they are young doctors, young lawyers, or maybe young engineers that they are able to fly high very soon, you know, then maybe they can start planning this while buying their first BTO or HTB resale. Therefore, five years, eight years, ten years down the road when they want to eventually, because their career has also progressed, buy another condo, they can do so without mm-hmm. additional buy stamp duty and, of course, having the full maximum loan to valuation. But another option would actually just be to sell the HTB, correct? And then if of they course. are yeah. both very, you know, earning quite a bit, then you can just buy two property after that. Yeah, property. That could be other, another option if you are thinking of exiting from the HTB totally, then yes, that is the best option in terms of still having two property, but it has to be two private properties now. But from your experience, which would people prefer usually? One condo, one HTB, or maybe two condos? Well, you see, HTB is very interesting, right? Some mm-hmm. of the people that I've met, it's just like buying a brand new EC. Time and time as realtors, I'm sure if another realtor is listening in, you would agree with me that it's so often we meet people of the, say for example, I want to go for a BTO mm. or I'm here to apply for some grants. Or if I'm a first timer buying a EC, I might be, my income might have crossed a household income of $16,000, mm. right? But I still want to try to appeal. Mm-hmm. Why, why? Why do people have this mentality? I feel like in my course of career of a 10 years horizon, right? I, I think it's just basically you feel good earning from the government. Oh. Right? You, you, you like benefited something from the government okay. or from the system. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I, I, I bought a BTO even though you know I'm almost crossing $12,000. Mm-hmm. Or, or, or oh yeah, I, I, I bought a EC, fresh brand new EC. Actually, my income was $18,000. But somehow due to appeal, due to uh, the way I structure my, my income because you're a businessman or whatsoever, yay, I, I, I scored a goal you know, by, by earning this EC. This this is never right and wrong because it's, 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 it's out of bounds for I think as a realtor to go and comment too much into a person's desire and and and, and what he wants in terms of how he wants to structure his deal. If you ask me, I can't say it's wrong. But of course to me is that I always believe if one is not eligible for either the type of properties that we're looking at, in this case EC or HDB, or one is not a, uh, eligible for the grants that uh, the government actually set out all these with a lot of careful planning as a nation uh, to help the lower income bracket people, then we should not go and, you know, kind of like think of ways to still benefit from the system. I I, I feel it should be given to those people who outright should benefit. Mm. And uh, with that mindset, it's not about right and wrong, but back to your question, is that often that we see uh, people wanting to have a HDB then a private property in this mindset? Yes. Mm. Because they just want a HDB and they feel like having a HDB holding on for the next 20 years, it's a cash cow, right? I mean, Think of it, if, if you bought a, like a Bidadari a couple of years back, maybe a four, four room flat would have cost you, what, four dollars $500,000, I, I think. And uh, in that sense, if it's still the same current rental environment, you might be able to rent it out for, I don't know, three, five, five thousand, oh, depending, the depending, depending right? Crazy. Depending on what kind of market we are talking about. Before COVID, I think three, five, four, no problem. Mm. After COVID, 5000 probably, if it's a fresh five years old newly renovated uh, mm. MOP flat. Mm. So on that sense, where else can you buy a property with $600,000 plus minus, mm-hmm. depending on what when you buy the Bidadari and, or, or what other BTOs are there that, as a four-room flat. But Max, I think, you know, good location. Um, so far, I think 600 plus is very, very fantastic location you're probably getting yourself into. What other properties in Singapore can yield you $4,000, $5,000? Whoa! Yeah, so with that crazy. mindset, there are people of this kind of uh, uh, mindset to who, who who will want to own it this way rather than two private properties. So actually really to each his own, right? At the end yeah, of the day. It's, it's to each his own. Some people just feel that, like like myself, if I were to use myself as an example, I have not owned a 99 years, uh, be it HTB, private property, house. 
Yeah, in my life. Oh. Not, not, not yet, not yet. Oh, so on that okay. thinking cap, I might not want to go back and own a HDB unless I got no choice. Because ultimately owning a HDB, I think, is to satisfy a need basis first. Yeah. Yeah, so if I have to have somewhere to just a simple roof over my head, I think that's perfectly why HDB were created for Singaporeans to, yeah. to have that opportunity yeah, to own yeah. a house. Yeah. yeah. But but for you personally, right, is there a reason why you did not go into a 99 years? It's, it's really just so happened because uh, my very first property, as I shared before, uh, was Swiss at Paya Lima. That's yeah. a very boutique project and it happens to be freehold and there was good value uh, very close to next shopping centre in Serangoon. And I thought five hundred or thousand dollars for a one bedroom, you know, freehold makes very makes a no brainer kind of uh, decision. Mm. And uh, moving forward, I think it has been always uh, upgraded into like be it the CCR condo at Watermark or like back to District Fifteen as a three bedroom at the Sea View, and uh, so on and so forth. When I do my investment in the shop houses, uh, so far I've been able to find good deals. Uh, either triple nine years or freehold and there was no need for me to explore the 99 years once. So it just so happened. La. Not it's that you're so against happened, but my years. first choice would have always... <laughs> no, I'm not against any type of property as long okay. as you make money, right? But mm. I mean, see, recently I met someone at a networking session and she was sharing with me how a lot of her own clients, she's a realtor, uh-huh. including herself, uh-huh. turned so many foes uh, from copy diams. Oh. Food courts, right? I mean, the, 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 the hawker centres or what you call the HTB shop house with the coffee shop element. Yeah. And these were in the past traded for like maybe three to four million dollars buying from the government through bidding. Okay. And these days you have seen those in issue and companies, they've been selling at 20 over 30 over million dollars. Okay. So it's not just five times, sometimes it's 10 times, right? Oh, so okay. I, I do believe any type of properties uh, you could make money as long as you're at the right entry price. So I'm not against 99 years for that matter, but uh, so happened for my own journey so far, it's been triple nine years of freehold. Mm, nice. Yeah. So we actually got a question from all of our viewers with regards to the owner-occupier scheme, mm. right? So they actually asked, do you think it's feasible for couples who are purchasing the upcoming plus and prime deep BTO with a 10 years MOB period? Any major mm. downsides? Very good question. So I have some friends, relatives, um, they are actually going through this phase of life where, you know, you go for a BTO try and to see whether you ballot and get a chance, right? So typically you get a queue number. If your queue number is early, you go for such a prime HGBs, you feel good again because mm. it's a benefit, right? Or, or basically mm. it's, it's like scoring a goal, uh, lottery. Lottery effect, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that being said, I usually, if they come and consult me, would ask them, or, or the first obvious question is to find out how old they are already, mm. right, in, in, in their lives. And let's say you are talking to a mid-20s uh, couple. By the time the PTO is ready, let's say four to five years, we are talking about close to uh, early 30s. Yeah. Right, once they are at their early 30s, if it's a 10 years MOP, mm-hmm. and not forgetting the 10 years MOP also apply to the next buyer buying over. So therefore, the property prices may not be able to trade up too high because mm-hmm. they got to be more prudent when they decide on your property ne- uh, next time. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about if you start to be able to explore any other types of properties or property investments as long as falling within Singapore in the residential context. Oh no, sorry, not just Singapore, right? Because... Your your MOP covers any residential property worldwide. Oh, uh, are you okay? Are serious? Uh? Yeah. Oh, you okay. cannot be owning any residential property worldwide. Uh, so even during my tenants MOP. Yeah. Oh. So I cannot MOP. like oh I got some care buy a condo in JB cannot. You can't. But <laughs> there are people who buy into service apartments, okay. hotel rooms, uh-huh. where these are like residential look alike, but they are termed or or, or, or zoned as commercial. So that uh-huh. might be a bit grey, but should be okay. Mm. Uh, don't quote me. <laughs> you can check with HDB. But what I mean is that, are you okay with, with, with not being able to rent out your house? Mm. Not being able to move basically until you are 40 years old. Whoa. Many of us, upon buying, you may think it's okay. But as I say again, when your career progress, when you make more money, when you get sick and tired of a small space that you start out with and now you have more children, you may not be so okay. Mm. So it's again to each his own, no right or wrong. But for me, I'm only at my, you know, uh, not 40 yet. I'm 35, 36 now. Um, I've already moved in terms of my residential houses about four times. Mm, mm. So... Would I be okay? I probably would not be okay. I okay. would be stuck in the same property for the next 10 years. <laughs> mm, okay. But in terms of even the loan, yeah, the potential future loan quantum, it will be affected, correct? Let's say they sell, they will be in the 40s, correct? The amount that they can loan will probably be affected with a loan tenure. That is very true, Sean. You see, if we talk about same rules again, because we never know what will the new rules be by then. 
But current rule states that at 35 years old, it's the last year that you can enjoy a full 30 years loan horizon for 75% LTV, loan to valuation. Mm. If you are 36 like me now, I only got 29 years. If I'm okay. 40, when I exit from my MOP mm. prime area BTO, mm. I would be only left with 25 years or, or less if I'm 40 plus. Yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah, okay. each year taken away from my time mm. of the loan, it also means that I, I need to compensate by either earning more mm -hmm. or borrowing less mm. Yeah, to have the same uh, mortgage payments every month. Mm -hmm. True. true. Yep. But even with this new whole BTO scheme, right, there is a certain clawback right, the government has announced right, whereby when you sell in the future, right, there will be a certain clawback on the profits. correct? Mm. So in the whole grand scheme of things, do you think this whole you know, lottery effect on a very prime kind of new BTO still makes sense for someone to enter? Well, I was somewhere and I think I overheard another person's conversation to each other and they mm. were just saying how they're very lucky they've scored this uh, uh, I think somewhere in Jalan Basau something like that mm -hmm. and I was just thinking in my mind um, it seems like he is very happy mm. probably also because he is not looking at exiting this property until his old age mm -hmm. so for such a profile mm. that this is your ultimate last stop or you're really not looking at property investment or flipping properties or or, or, or like, you know, upgrading short short term, short term, short term upgrading, then I feel it's very good to mm. to for such a profile person or such a mindset person. How old is this person? Young. I think based on observation, probably already in his forties. Oh wow, really this. Uh, like yeah, yeah. So I think I think yeah. if he think of it as oh yeah, you know, we, uh. we got somewhere in Jalan Basa mm. or mm -hmm prime area mm -hmm. uh, it seems quite good because okay. he didn't seem like he was talking about uh, flipping with his yeah, friends yeah, you know and, yeah. and he accepted that by the time he's in his 50s 60s he, he, he probably not looking to sell mm. be because the convenience is there right I mm. mean staying in town so with that I think uh, it makes sense for what the government is planning mm. whereby as you as you mentioned the word again lottery effect mm. we do not want to have another pinnacle at Duxton where Ooh, you know yeah. while everybody just become overnight millionaires because the fact that they got lucky through their balloting. It's yeah. just a bit, well, it's, it's a good thing, right, for, for the citizens who have bought, but is it really uh, the best for everybody? Mm. Because the whole, well, I, I think if you have unlimited supply of prime area properties, okay, but the, the, the fact is that we've got limited land. So back to the classification, right? So this whole prime thing will only be launched, if I'm not wrong, I think next year. Right, mm. so there are there will be uh flats like Pano Pinnacle and stuff that are excluded from this classification, correct? But they are still located in very prime areas, correct? So do you think there will be effect whereby this split this uh, properties that are not classified under this new scheme will continue to grow exponentially because they are not restricted the same kind of restrictions that these new properties will be restricted under? Well, probably because you see, I think just two days ago I saw an article predicting that the Duxton. Uh, HDB flats two may million. even hit 2 million. <laughs> I, I'm sure you saw that article. Uh. So, so having said that, I think actually if you just treat the property like housing, mm. we don't go into whether it's a HDB public housing or not because ultimately it's just a little bit of rules that mm. we're talking about that you cannot sell within five years, eligibility to buy, you cannot be owning a flat just like 15 months ago, stuff mm. like that. Mm. As long as, as, as all these things you're okay with it, mm. it's just a housing and not just housing, you're in Chinatown. Mm. I think that, yeah, it's very possible that prices will continue to climb for such mm. places. Nice, nice. Yeah. All right, so moving on, right, we were speaking about, just actually last episode, we were speaking about, you know, property investment vis-a-vis -vis ETFs or bond investment, mm, correct? correct? Somehow we still keep getting similar questions <laughs> regarding that. So I have another question here. So they were also saying that instead of buying a property, right, investing in the bond paying 4% on 600K can get you about $24,000. Less work, lower cost. Not saying property is bad, but you have, you have, you don't have to pay your stamp duties, your agent fee, maintenance fee, income tax, renovation cost, property tax. Small unit capital growth is also not really as good now. So what do you think about that? Well, as always, small units, because of the smaller square area, definitely your capital growth, you cannot compare with a four-bedroom rising up the same $100 PSF. One would be, let's say, 2,000 square feet, you're already making, what, 100 PSF, $200,000, mm. right? So so obviously, it's, 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 it's cannot be compared. Mm. But having said that, again, I think this question only applies when you have too much money. <laughs> let's, let's, let's be real, right? I mean, if you have limited funds okay, and you only got that hundred uh, over thousand yeah, dollars, then you are okay, thinking okay. whether to buy a one bedroom or you're thinking whether to buy ETFs or, 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 or save up. Of course, you're struggling, right? But because 
then I just guess that maybe such a profile you're still sitting with your parents okay. and, and good for you that you have that roof over your head. That's very true. Practical actually. because if you have already a home mm-hmm. and this is again whatever reason you are in a profile where you can buy another one without ABSD because you are married or you have a partner that you can use his name for then yes this question applies and I think that back to the leveraging point of view you can calculate all the things out there be it interest be it property tax, be it your maintenance fee, which I totally agree. And even your personal income tax when you make the rentals, right? Ultimately, uh, 600k property, if it can grow to 700, 800k, you would be very good. But again, with the leveraging effect, you only put out 100 over $1,000. Mm. If you can exit at $700,000, if you bought a 600,000 flat, you kind of like almost, almost, I wouldn't say double up your money, but you may, maybe 70% mm. up. Uh, if you increase that by a little bit more, if you held it longer, if you can exit at, let's say, eight hundred over thousand dollars then you will definitely see the hundred over percent increment based on your equity that you came up with. Mm. Can we see the same for ETFs in the same, let's say, five to ten years horizon? I think you could, but it may not be for sure. Mm. And there are bound to be certain restrictions. Now, restrictions, having said sense. that, uh, restrictions to leverage, ma. Not, oh, not everybody okay. yeah, would, okay. would want to leverage on buying bonds and funds and things like that. I think it's uh, very much more expensive than a housing loan. Mm, okay. Having said that, myself, mm. I came from an accounting background. Mm-hmm. Working for a CPA firm, I cannot be buying into certain stocks, shares, Serious bonds. Are, even when you, that's your previous job. Yeah, that's my previous job, correct. So it's your previous job, now you still cannot. Oh, no, 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 because my wife is still working oh, in such a place. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, um, so as a spouse, I am not able to oh, okay. freely. Okay. Uh, even if the stock is deemed to be safe today, uh. say, let's say the firm takes on something relatable to this uh, uh, company by the next year and I am forced to sell at market price, is that worthwhile for me? But again, this is very personal mm-hmm. because it only affects me yes, uh, and, and probably the viewers who are also in the same CPA firm yes. or firms. <laughs> uh, having said that, that is also another point to think, right, mm-hmm. for myself. Mm-hmm. And back to the first instance where I wanted to answer this question based on how much money do you have? Mm. It's, it's the same where, you know, in the past, I have had like financial planners meeting up for, for coffee with me. And sometimes I explain to them why, in my personal point of view, it might not make sense for me to put small little bits of monies into unit trust. Mm. Um, even though they can show me like a very healthy yield, a few per- few percentage points, which are very, very safe throughout the years that this fund has been uh, producing. Mm. Now, but you see, if I have done so, I might have been slowed down in terms of what I have in capital, mm. unless I'm loaded. Mm. Let's be real. Mm. When I went into my first CCR property, mm. I almost went all in. Mm-hmm. I have had enough just for renovation okay, and probably a little bit more like thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 just to get by. Oh. But of course, I was a realtor and I knew okay. that if I work hard and I get a few deals going on, uh. I should see a, another $50,000 in my bank again soon. Mm, okay. But there was a risk, right? How many no, yeah, of yeah, us yeah, yeah. are willing to take the same risk but not on housing? Because like I say again, housing, at least I saved one thing, which is rental, unless I get stuck with my parents. Mm-hmm. Or, or what, after marriage, I, I, I ask my wife to stay with me with my parents or her parents. It just doesn't make sense. Mm. Not for everybody. So mm. again, to each his own. Some people are okay with that. Some people are blessed to be able to stay with your parents for, for, for quite a while. Mm. Then you have the benefit to own properties as well as uh, trade in terms of uh, equities and funds. Uh, otherwise, then I think it's always important to save up your capital to put into your first property first. Mm. So settle the need first. I hope ultimately you still go back to that, right? Correct, yeah. Need. Because when I have had the need to stay in a three-bedroom, mm. I also remember by the time I decouple, by the time I put my money down for the second property, I, I don't have much left. <laughs> we talk about like, well, I'm going into a $2 over million property back oh, then. Oh, 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 oh. And I think I, I had barely $100,000 left. Oh, so half a million. Renovation was $80,000. Mm. So, but again, because of my job, probably I knew that there's some commissions coming in in a bigger quantum. I dare to take that risk. Okay. How many of us, how many of us dare to do the same thing for ETFs? Mm. Right? Unless, again, your roof over your head is protected and 100% there. Mm. Yeah. True, true, true. Mm. So I think this nicely uh, leads to our next question, right? Because actually we were actually going through um, the hot topic news for today, mm. right? So we actually saw an article on each prop that actually said that there were higher mortgages, sale listings and options in third quarter of this year amidst tougher economic condition. Mm. So this number, right, was actually 24% higher quarter on quarter, right, as compared to the previous quarter. So now we are at about 100 plus mortgages sale. 
right? right. So firstly, maybe we, before we dive into this article itself, right? I think there are a lot of our viewers out there wondering, right? Whether mortgage sale is it always like a lay long? Is it always a bargain? What do you think about that? Well, I would say that these days, um, it's difficult to find big properties at attractive prices. Just put it this way. Mm. And in the case of recently, there was this 11 at Holland. Mm. It's a classic example of what I call, I mean, you get the sexy road name at Holland, right? Mm. Yet it's kind of like a landed property, even though it's a cluster right? right? Mm. But at least you can buy something for two over million dollars, Holland again, and landed few. Mm. You <laughs> cannot have that elsewhere. Mm, mm. Well, so with the same mindset, when these things go onto the market, mm. I think uh, we talked about it before, is it a good buy mm. or is it that it does not exist for such a supply? Mm. I think it's the later. Mm. Well, it's still a good buy because the fact that it doesn't that does not exist. It's just like, for example, right now, what is a value of, I think another recent case, the Bank Coolant two-bedroom, um, they were doing like low $1 million. It's huge, right? 800 plus to 900 plus square feet. It's right smack boogies, if you think of it. Why was it able to sell so fast? I think about 60 units were sold. In my opinion, again, of course, it's a fair deal, but not say like a super good deal. It's just that nobody else in Bangkulan was selling other than the, the one owner of that tower. Mm. The other tower, you may once in a while get certain owners trying to sell. Mm. But when so much of the mortgagee units or um, similar nature come onto the market, then the buyers who are there able to accept a $2 over million dollars landed, mm -hmm. or in the just now example that I've given, $1 over million dollars, two bedroom, large size CCR condo. This is when you see a lot of buyers, this is the event where a lot of buyers start to flood into the market. Mm -hmm. They always had this liquidity. Just like previous episode we mentioned, actually in order to start seeing prices drop, we need to have people losing their jobs. Mm. This is this is unfortunately the fact because Correct. otherwise there's so much money and liquidity in the market. Mm. Whenever a good deal or a fair deal of a low quantum comes on the market, it gets snapped out so quickly. So to answer your question about whether or not a mortgagee sale is always a good sale, I do not personally think so. Mm. It still res uh, results into like basic fundamentals that you need to go through with your realtor, <laughs> planner, <laughs> to see whether or not, what are you trying to do? Is it a first home? Is it a opportunity kind of thing where you think that this is a rare opportunity and, and, and you know, you want to own a two-bedroom CCR, would there be another one at $1.2 million, 800 over square feet? Probably not. Mm. Probably not. Then yes, in that same thinking cap, it's a good deal. But the two examples that you highlighted earlier, right? right. These are not mortgages sale, correct? Uh, probably the earlier one was a sale, but um, I, I think it's more of they volunteered to sell through a auction kind of uh, mm. manner, yeah. Maybe for our viewers out there, mm. right? So maybe you can explain a bit, how does a mortgage sale come about? Is it because someone cannot pay his mortgage, then you try to liquidate as far as possible, then the, the banks actually take it out and sell it or what? How does well, it happen? okay. Um, the term mortgage, right? Mm. Obviously, it means that you are right to say that the property is already on a mortgage. Mm. The term auction does not necessarily mean that it's in trouble. That's why we put it on auction. It's just sometimes more, a more fun way or a different way to sell your property. <laughs> okay. right? I think recently we can see a lot of TikTok videos. Uh, I think Australian properties, uh -huh. those landed houses oh. are sold live on auction. That yeah. is, this seems to be quite fun, okay. especially when the um, buyers are there waiting to yeah, 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 yeah. outbid Very each exciting. other. Yes. So again, mortgage sale does not always happen in this nature. Mm -hmm. It does not have to be a auction. Okay. Right. So back to what is mortgage sale? Yes, it could be someone unable to pay okay. due to health reasons, due to loss of job, due to the fact that maybe the bank do not recognize the same as it is anymore of the higher quantum loan that they have given you. Mm -hmm. So for example, now prices are all time high mm. and you you bought a new property, mm. right? And then you take a full loan on it. A mm. couple of years down the road, let's say, let's say prices do soften. Mm. Then the bank say, hey, I think you over leveraged because back then the property was $2 million you borrowed like 1.5 million on it. And now the property is only worth 1.5 million dollars. The same 75% should be much lower in terms of loan. Mm. Right, so can can you pay me back? That, Whoa, how often does this happen? That's what we call uh, basically clawing back of your loan, right? Quite rare, right? Um, It's rare. I have heard it uh, happening for mixed developments. A lot of mi mixed developments get hit like that. Oh. Especially for the strata retail units. Right, I am not going to name names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to keep this reputation good, yeah. but there are some that I hear from my mortgage banker friends mm. who have shared with me that quite a few of such places get actually a callback of funds where oh. they feel that you're over leveraged. Wow. 
Having said that, that could be one way why a property is up for mortgage sale. Lastly, it could be a passing on of the owner mm. and the remaining uh, survivors may not be or, or, or the people who are taking over the property may not be able to afford the property mm. in terms of the mortgage payments and therefore it's put up onto sale. Mm. Mm. So but this mortgage sale um, is directly marketed by the banks, is it? Well, the banks um, typically don't market their own properties. They can, they, they, they might put out a list and a lot of realtors may list it out as an open listing. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes the banks may actually hire one appointed exclusive agency mm-hmm. to market their properties for them. So it's not necessarily um, always exclusive. It, it's not also necessarily always directly by the bank. So maybe I can, for our viewers out there, maybe so just a graphical understanding, right? So first, the banks will create the listings, right? Mm-hmm. Then they can do it, they can, they, they can allow it, market the listing in various, various ways, right? One of it is the option, the auction, like we talked about previously, or appointing an agency, or make it like an open listing. Am I right yep. to say it that? It's as good as you have pointed out, like any other single seller. Mm. You could sell as a single seller directly. You could sell as a single seller through an agent. You could also sell through an agency to go by auction. Mm. Yep. So I think a lot of people have this understanding that, okay, so if it's mortgages, so probably it's a distressed listing. Yep. Therefore, I can probably get a good deal, uh, can lowball the, the seller, for example. What do you think? I think last time people had this thinking about going to auctions for mm. good deals. Mm. Somehow, because I think maybe internet, things are so fast, information is so widely available. Oh. Today, the banks are also having a lot more resources. Mm. I don't think a super good deal will come to, to the market so easily mm. because banks holding power are strong as well. They oh. could easily okay. take it over. Let's say OCBC, they have okay. their own property arm anyway, right? And oh, if the property okay. makes sense, they probably want to absorb it themselves rather than <laughs> lay long it out. I, I, I mean, I, I think it's that way. Okay. I have okay. not seen a super good lay long sale, especially, you see, in the case of the earlier two that we've given, mm. Again, how much money you talk about? Mm. You talk about five million up. Of course, mm. there may be a chance you can buy a four million dollars property at, that, that that is actually worth four, five million dollars. Mm. But if you want the same thing of a one million dollars discount on a one two million dollars property, how can it be? <laughs> how, it's just, it's just, I just need to reduce a little bit. Someone else would have bought it already, mm. man. How how much a good discount can it be? Mm. Right. So, I did one recently uh, last year. Um, it was like a sale through a lawyer. Okay. Because of a person passing on. Okay. In fact, in fact, there were a few. One, this one that I'm thinking about is um, a residential one. Mm. The price was like hundred, two hundred thousand dollars for a three bedroom OCR, cheaper, snapped oh. up in- immediately. How about how was it so? Through through the lawyers directly, uh, without a representing agent. I can uh. Yeah, I mean, they, then how they, do they you do, do that? Then how do you market your property? Just issue a sellers, uh, sorry, a uh, sales and purchase agreement. Okay, and, but, uh, but how do they market the property? How do people know about it? They probably have someone just spreading, you know. On oh, so it's ground. like the underground thing, really. It's not really underground, underground per se, yeah. but like people just spread word. Like, like the other one I was thinking of is my own one. Okay. I bought a pair of shop houses okay. on Arab Street and okay. Haji Lane. I think we shared that before. Mm. And that was through a lawyer as well. Oh. So sometimes the deals get a little bit better. I wouldn't say that I got a super good deal. Oh. It's quite funny because, you see, when we hire a lawyer to do such thing, now, no offense to any lawyers out there, mm. but... This is not an everyday thing that they are doing, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, to, yeah. to sell properties uh, yeah. through their firm. Mm. I obviously knew of the value of the properties that I was about to bid oh, for. Okay. And I knew that if I buy them together, uh-huh. individually, they, they, they're worth more. Yeah. However, due to circumstance of the family having this inheritance mm. and of the advice of the lawyers, they chose to sell this property as a pair. Mm, and mm. nothing else but a pair. So okay. both properties must be sold together. Okay. In fact, I remember very clearly that the lawyers were so afraid that I would exercise one and not the other. They added this clause that both properties must be, must be exercised in tandem together. Okay. Immediately when I bought it, uh, I received offers not just from buyers, mm-hmm. but even from realtors themselves who are planning to buy. Oh, okay. Yep, so eventually, uh, we sold them okay. because the fact that as, as I profit, carefully uh. predicted correctly, uh, buying together make a lot of sense because it's cheaper. Mm. Selling them separately, they're worth more. Mm. Yeah. But I think I think then the, the question that everybody will be asking you next is how do you get to know of such low bunks? Again, it was it was <laughs> on the ground because like being on the ground, people know you're actively buying, people know you're actively having buyers on hand. Mm. That is what helps me a lot in terms of my reputation. Mm. And I think back to our last week's uh, podcast again, mm your net worth, mm. right, is all from networking. Mm. And I think knowing people is very important in our line. Nice, yeah. nice, amazing. 
So that like, it was not on any like property portal whatsoever for this. Probably there were some opportunistic uh agents advertising like a blank listing or mm. a fake ad or something like that, mm. which I think a lot of us hate, right? But uh, having said that, I I don't think the lawyers or the owners specifically hired any agent for that matter mm. to go and advertise. Mm. But there's always opportunists out there. As, as a salesperson that we just hope to be able to advertise and, and, and get in the buyers and to, to help them to find. But for me, because I come in as a buyer, mm. I knew about the listings through people on the ground, mm. right? And they have led me directly to the Amazing. lawyers, yeah. Mm. So, so back to our, mm. yeah, sorry. So these things happen, both mm. residential and commercial. Mm. So back to our mortgagee question, right? right? Yeah. So basically, we said that mortgagee sale is just another method of sale, correct? Not necessarily a good sale, correct? Uh, no, no, no. Mortgagee sale mm. is because of the three reasons we gave, right? Mm. So first would be that it's a distressed sale. Mm. Second, it might be an inherited property and the new owner cannot take on the, the, the current loan. Mm. Or maybe um, it's a clawback of certain funds and the person cannot afford to give them back cash mm. in terms of the bank mm. and uh, they just have to liquidate the property. Mm. Mm. So it, it is uh, a sale, not a method of the sale. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. But, yeah. but I mean, whether it's uh, at the selling price, whether it's good, you still need to do your homework lah, and the due correct, diligence, correct. right? To, know. to me, to me, good deals will never happen so often for low quantum properties. Mm. Even if it's out there, you just got to be super fast. Mm. Like, you see, sometimes properties in the shop house world, especially, in, in, uh, in fact, for the, the one I bought and sold on Haji Lane, mm. I have not even stepped foot inside the property. You buy, yeah? Both when I bought and, and when sell. I sell, I have never been in there. Whoa, I have okay. never ever been in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, but how many how many people are so ready to buy such a good deal? Mm -hmm. You you have to be well informed. You have to be really knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. You must be having a lot of uh, uh courage. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You must have done your sums right, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you can go in. Mm. Yeah. So I think uh, same thinking for residential properties. Mm. If it's a low quantum, a lot of people are willing to do what I did. Mm. buying it just flipping it out mm. it's three years you know you make some capital gains and, and, and we, we, we move on mm. but many of us at the same time are first timers mm. being a first timer you may be always very careful mm. you think hey how about like should we go and check water leakage lah? Hey, why got scratch on the floor you know the parking not so clean the wall you should paint yes, a little yes, bit yes, first yes, yes. you buying it as is where it is I mean it's a good deal why are you talking about things that probably cost you a few hundred dollars to fix mm. yeah so it's sort of a different mindset that we can find different type of buyers. So that's why I always tell buyers, by the way, those of them who always come to me, hey, Aaron, got a lobang, tell me. Uh, mm. Got good lobang, must share. Mm. I always ask them back, how ready are you? Mm. Are you able to buy without viewing? Because if they are not able to, I have like 10 buyers who are able to, who do I tell about this good lobang first? Mm. Let's, let's be real again. Oh right? yeah, true. I got true, no choice, but I have to true, tell those that are super ready first. Ma. Mm. So by the time it gets to their ears, probably the lobang is not so good. That's why it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's true, that's yeah. true. Okay. So so is there any way, let's say if the property is on property guru or whatever this thing, right? Is there any way to tell that, you know, uh maybe this this owner is in having a distress situation? Maybe I can lowball the person, maybe I can get a better glow out of it. <laughs> in in this case, I think uh, either you are very savvy mm -hmm. or you're like engaging me to help you. <laughs> I would be okay. always there. Hit us up. <laughs> right, I mean, I will always be there uh, watching the property mm. market mm. and it's like what you say, so timely, right? Mm. It's again back to the easiest example of rentals. Mm. Why are we able to tell landlords so confidently that rental has dropped mm. but they themselves are not able to accept? Mm. Because, actually, I do not blame them because the fact is that we are every day on the ground. Mm. Let's say a $4,000 listing. Okay. I used to be able to run out like that snap of finger. I may even get 4005 you know, for that matter, even though advertising at $4,000. Versus $4,000 advertisement price and there's no calls at all. Do I not know that it cannot go out so quickly? Mm. Then then we have to fall back to think, is that the opportunity cost that we want to go through? Mm. Per week, if it's a $4,000 rental unit, we're right. talking about per week, $1,000 loss. Actually, you do the sums, you're renting out 3000 plus if you have accepted 3008 for example, mm. immediately. Right. So, having said that, back to sale, good lobang, it's all based on experience and how much of time you spend on the ground, mm. hunting listings down, you know, refreshing the portals, chit-chatting with an uh, agent. Mm. This is interesting to know also that there's a lot of older agents. Mm. They are very, very well um, connected mm. and they do have good deals, huh? but they do not probably have property guru accounts themselves. Ooh. And these good deals... Again, word of mouth comes along to my ear. 
I may then first introduce to my highest tier ready customers, man. That's crazy. There's, there's, there's no way that, you know, these these are like deals that are not even, what we call like uh, pocket listings, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, so it's not even revealed to anybody yet okay. and we know about it. Okay. So either we can grab grab hold of it ourselves mm. within our own small little community that we serve then we know they are so ready. Or of course, uh, after a while, if it's still not available to be sold, uh, sorry, if it's still not sold yet, then we only then blast it all out to the different platforms. Mm, I see. So the article was saying that it's a 24% increase quarter on quarter in terms of the listings, correct? Is that a worrying sign into this market? Well, I think definitely we all know as a realtor that the uh, property market is very, very soft now, both in terms of rentals and uh, property so, prices. Yeah. Um, well, one for property prices is due to the fact that there isn't any much of a supply in that sense for new condos in the OCR region that is very affordable. Mm. Um, a lot of uh, new lands have not been either uh, built up or uh, released for sale yet. Mm. And a lot of on blocks are not happening in these kind of locations. Mm. Not like in 2016 to 18, we have seen a lot of OCR on blocks, mm. especially in the HU, ex-HUDC yeah. estates. Yeah. Right, so those can give us an opportunity to find better value properties. But right now, we are not able to. Therefore, the numbers are slower. Mm. Yeah, so I don't think it's a worrying sign per se, like, you know, market's going to crash or, uh, you know, ah, hold your horses and, you know, don't sell now. It's all back to the point about what is the whole point about. Are you selling or buying because of a need to downsize, upsize or to find a roof over your head? Or are you just buying because of an investor being um, opportunist coming into the market to see whether that's a good deal? Mm. So then that determines um, what, deals you should look at. But a lot of the, I think we spoke about this previously, yeah. a lot of the investors who are just purely on an investment basis are actually waiting and see, correct? Hmm. Waiting on sidelines, right? Correct. Uh, yeah. So, so is it is it because they, they, they feel that, you know, we are in an uncertain environment where they're not afraid, they're afraid to commit or is it just, you know, um, yeah, now is not the time for them? I think it could be a lot of things. Like first, interest rates environment very high and job security might be one. They might not be so sure that their jobs can last them through mm. or the companies will still be around. Mm. You know, there's a lot of tech companies folding up exiting Singapore. Mm. A few days ago, we saw uh, well, WeWorks, you know, like collapsing. Yeah. That definitely will affect a lot of uh, landlords and building owners as well who have leased out properties to them. Mm. Or uh, a lot of uh, SMEs or tech companies who are renting offices from them. Mm. So I think that the market is really very uncertain in terms of uh, job security mm. and where the interest is actually moving towards. Mm. So therefore, those who are not in a neat form to buy, they are probably holding up first. Mm. Yeah. But going back to the WeWork example, right, yeah. correct, do you think it will negatively affect or how it affects Singapore's uh, rental space in that sense? Is that any well, big these floor plates are usually, they, WeWorks, they don't go to small areas, right? Yeah. So I think these floor plates of the office sizes are probably quite large and uh, I don't foresee it being like a tremendous uh, negative effect. Probably there are just more listings now available. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah but I don't think I don't think uh, we're talking about like affecting everyday people. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because any, anyway, previously from your experience, uh, big floor based rental are already slowing down, right? With Correct. The and economic conditions. But you, you think about it, they are not so easily available in the first place. Mm. To have a couple of floors in one building altogether, mm. or maybe one whole building list out to be works right. So it's not a typical thing that we do see available in the market all the time. Mm. So now that it's available because of a, uh, uh, you know, we were sitting, I think it just means that you know those who are looking for such places have more listings to consider, um, but not necessarily a lay long listings to consider. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I mean, they so they didn't buy the the the, the place right. They probably just rented uh, it out. So. In, mostly in Singapore, are not bought here. Yeah. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. I think uh, it is a good juncture for us to take a break. I think it's just nice 45 minutes anyway. <laughs> so yes, great. thank you so much for your time today. So let us know if you have any other questions and feel free to leave it in anywhere you're watching this, be it on TikTok, Instagram, or YouTube as well. And with that, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Unfitted with Boss 1 and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.